Hi folks and welcome to another incredible episode of North of Chaos. I am your most humble host, James Wolf. And today we had one of my very good friends on, Sarah Orbanic. She's an incredible photographer. I think most people in the fitness world in LA and worldwide definitely know her. She's also an incredible student of the conscious life. And we really dove into some cool stuff. She's actually on a week-long listening retreat in Colorado right now. And we really dove into that, how a lot of self-recognition stuff comes up, how to be a better partner, how to listen more to others and yourself and be more graceful with everyone in your life and so much more. So before we dive in, make sure you share, like, follow, ring a bell and all the other wild, silly things you must do to keep this show alive. That would mean the world to me. So without further ado, let's dive in with Sarah. Listening class? I'm taking an eight-hour listening class every day. What is what is that? A listening class? Yes, learning how to listen. Tell me. My, my boyfriend thought I was a terrible listener and signed me up for this <laughs> class and just <laughs> tipped me off. <laughs> oh, tell me more about the listening class. Eight hours a day? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for three fill solid Fill me in, days. please. Please fill um, me in. Well... You know, I do, I already understood the importance of listening. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dia Khan. Yeah. Yeah. She did Tell the me more. amazing, yeah. she did that amazing documentary where she went and hung out with Ku Klux Klan members and just through sitting them and letting them speak and giving them the space to speak and say everything that they needed to say, they eventually one by one, like stop being KKK members and some of them even had the you know tattoo removals and so Whoa. you know there's it's yeah there's another man who went and listened to oh, this uh, black man he went listened to Ku Klux Klan members and converted 200 of them just by listening that's wild i mean that's a whole that's a whole thing in itself the whole yeah. idea of listening i'm yeah. i think we're all on that journey you know i like to talk uh -huh. but i also am trying to listen more right and i you know, I was graced with the, I don't know. It's a good thing now. It wasn't. But I was born with the hearing problem, right? Degenerative nerve loss in my ears. So I've always had bad hearing my whole life. And there's oh. always, you know, a deeper emotional, spiritual, conscious reason for things, especially when it comes to senses, I think. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now I have to, I've been learning how to listen with like my energy so much more because I can't hear shit. I so, didn't know this. I did not no? know this about you because I was a terrible listener and I probably didn't hear that the first time you told me. I don't me. scream it. I don't, I don't scream that at everybody, but I say like, I say, I say what a lot, even if I've heard you, it's such a bad habit. And sometimes I'll even tell you that I heard you and you don't need to repeat yourself. But yeah, no, listening is such a huge thing. So what okay. have you learned so far in your, how long, how long have you been there now? Has it been a couple of days of it? Um, today was my second day. Um, we're learning about the different behavioral styles. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, I actually held this uh, salon at my house years ago that I invited you to. My friend Sandra yes. Bennett was there and she had these I archetypes. Know. Remember that? And I it do. Was all Aiden, about... Aiden was there. Yeah, we all, I brought my yeah. friend there. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And it was all about figuring out people's different archetypes. So this is very similar, but they don't call it archetypes. They call it behavior styles. So that okay. you can watch people's behavior and figure out um, how to communicate the best with them and also how to listen to them in the best possible way. But at the end of the day, you're not listening to everybody kind of the same. Um, so I'm learning about that and I'm really kind of connecting who I am, kind of like what my needs are and also all the people that are around me and are like really close to me. And so what I'm finding is that like, let's say my boyfriend who doesn't feel heard, um, that is how he feels safe. When he's heard, he heard. feels right. and being fur heard, he feels safe and he feels loved. Yeah. Um, and I'm the opposite. I I want results. I want action. I don't care about being hmm. heard. I just want to work towards what are we going to do that's going to make the situation better next time. Coming up with solutions. Um, and so obviously, when you have two different needs, you're trying to give the other person what you need and not necessarily what they need. And so it's been really helpful in kind of like figuring out who's who in my life. 
and how I need to show up for those people. Yeah, <laughs> that's no, different for sure. From, different from what I need. So, you know, like if I go to somebody with my problems, it's because I want a solution and I want to hear a solution to my problem. Otherwise, right. I would voice myself. Because I don't want to well, just, just like... A, you hit a huge thing there. Is like You have to ask people what they want out of that. Because so many people yeah. assume that solution is what someone wants. So they automatically offer advice, right? And I, I've really come... I, I'm someone that does that. And because of that, I've really recognized that and stopped doing that. But I'm also seeing, because I'm so aware of it, how often people will do that with me. And it's such a beautiful thing when someone will say, do you just want to be heard right now? Or do you want a piece of advice. And that question is such a great way to start off a conversation when someone needs to get something off their chest. Yeah. So yeah, that's a huge one. That's a huge one. Are you, yeah. because I, you know, I won't say his name, but for what your boyfriend does, obviously being heard is kind of his whole thing. So obviously he would want that from someone intimate. Like, you know, if he can do that with people, he for sure would need that from an inter, you know, on a personal intimate level. Absolutely. And just from studying the different behavioral styles, what I discovered is that he actually needs that more than all the other behavioral styles. Hmm. That's even more. Where do you think meaning, that comes from? That's even more meaningful to him. And what I'm learning, this is a good question, is to not judge. So the minute that yeah. I start asking, oh, where does that come from? Is it that childhood thing that happened? I'm already exercising yeah. the judgmental mind instead of just seeing it as for what it is. And so that's what I'm also learning on this trip to not get caught up in the details and not try to figure out, well, why is this person like this? What's wrong with them that they have this thing, right? Because right? it's, it's easy for us to go, well, that's not normal. Well, in that the story doesn't style, matter. Right. The story doesn't matter. And in that behavioral style, it's completely normal. And in that behavioral style, that is the blueprint. And so now I need to start really seeing people as a blueprint. Mm -hmm. they're, they're blueprints that are capable of being more than just that blueprint, but yes. not having to figure out like if well, it's you're a student right of, or wrong. Right. You're a student of observation. You're aside from me, you're one of my favorite photographers aside wrong. from myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like what you, you know, you study the human condition. That's like what you do. So, Yes, the story doesn't matter. And that, that relates so much to just general trauma. And even with this, the story doesn't matter. But it is something I enjoy diving into as a way to further harmonize. I don't know. Is that is that egoic at all? Is that still... It's not something I attach a heavy meaning to. Yeah. But the, the student of humanity that is within me wants to know where that does come from. Because mm -hmm. it does help me acclimate to you i think at a deeper level if i kind of know where that comes from you know yeah i mean there's a certain level of being able to have compassion for somebody but if i don't create that judgmental mind to begin with then i don't right. have to develop a sense of compassion either right. um i can only speak for myself and speaking for myself i really have two behavioral styles and they they take turns i'm a little okay. bipolar right there's sarah <laughs> And then there's someone I call Cutie. Oh. Queen Trauma. Tell us more. C queen yeah, Trauma. Tell us more about Queen Trauma Cutie. Yeah, Queen Trauma Cutie. And I wanted it to be something cute so that I don't feel horrified every time I call myself by the <laughs> other other name. Um, yeah. Is when my nervous system is dysregulated. And uh -huh. so who I am and how grounded I am and how well I'm able to listen to you and how well I'm able to show up for you is if I'm Sarah or cutie, mm. if I'm Sarah, I probably like myself. Mm -hmm. I'm probably grounded. I'm not reactive mm -hmm. and I can hear what you need to say. But if I'm in my cutie state, um, I'm dysregulated, I'm reactive, I don't right. feel safe, I'm looking to feel safe, I'm looking to fill my needs instead of take care of yours. Okay, what brings on cutie? And how do you regulate cutie? Um, I think there's a lot of past trauma, childhood sure. trauma that brings sure. on cutie, um, abandonment, mm -hmm. not feeling good enough, 
feeling like I'm mm -hmm. being manipulated. All these stories have thoughts that are attached to these, that have, like certain thoughts that come up. And then when these certain things and th certain ideas come up, my nervous yeah. system will completely go out of whack. I can feel my body temperature changing. I can feel pings in my body. I can feel my chest pain. Um, yeah. There's all sorts of stuff it's that tight. happens. Yeah. yeah. There's all, all these like physical things. And the interesting thing about this is, I've been dealing with this my whole life and with this comes a lot of like thoughts, um, mm -hmm. like a spiral of thoughts yeah. they are endless and they just keep coming and coming and coming. And, you know, I, I, I thought that I was, I thought that was a really great Buddhist for the last 17 years because as all these thoughts come up, I'm like, all right, there's attachment. There's, you know, I, I'm yeah. looking at all of these and I'm labeling them and I'm naming them. And then I'm, trying to utilize all these techniques to work with my thoughts. And what I didn't realize is that what I need to address is my nervous system. Yes. Yes. That when I address my nervous system, the thoughts stop. So it's kind of like I've been working uphill, running uphill with a hundred pound vest on trying to work with my thoughts mm -hmm. instead of like mm -hmm. going straight to the nervous system. So you have the nervous system part, which I find is such a huge part. But then the ego also likes to create stories because that's the biggest way that the ego can maintain itself, especially through trauma. And, you know, I've known you almost for, oh, since 2017. So that's a, that's a hot minute. I've known you for a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I know that, you know, myself included, this is everyone does, you know, we repeat relational dynamics, even if mm -hmm. we know, even if we see that it's not benefiting us, it's not bringing us value, we repeat these certain things. So what about, like, how do you tackle that part? How do you tackle the part that your ego has convinced your thinking mind to do in order to continue bringing in, because you've tackled the central nervous systems, you can emotionally yeah. regulate yourself, but that isn't going to stop you from suddenly being excited by someone that fuels that codependent part that fuels that trauma so that you can continue to experience that. So what's that second part? If you've even begun that journey too, because that's, that's um, the thing I'm, I'm also working on. Yeah. I haven't begun that journey right now. I'm just like leaning into <laughs> for, 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 for me right now. I'm still on like the beginning. How do you steps. calm down? Yeah. I'm, I'm still in the beginning steps of like, how yeah. do I regulate my nervous system so I can think like Sarah and totally. not cutie and deal with a situation in a way that's not going to be reactive and, and, yes. and be able to listen to the other person. And then we can both come out of this alive. Um, yeah. and so <laughs> alive, alive is good. We want everyone to be alive. <laughs> yeah. And the first thing that I did was like, okay, I know, I know what it is now. And, and I, that just knowing that it's my nervous system and not my mind, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, there's answer for mm -hmm. answers for this. And this is great. So I immediately yeah. like, I reached out to Liz Letchford who does the body church and I was like, all right, girl, like, um, can we spend some time together and figure out what you're doing for your work for the nervous system when she does a lot of things yeah. in the movement? I reached out to my buddy, Joshua Werner, who works with soldiers with PTSD mm. to find out what he does. So I'm like reaching out to all these people, like breathwork specialists, and I'm just going to yeah. try a little bit of everything and see what works. But interestingly enough, in this time of like gathering my, um, gathering a team around me, I also started to become a lot more aware of those thoughts before my nervous system spirals. Yes. And as those thoughts come up, to, which are driven by the ego, by the way. Sure. So, absolutely. Right. The ego that wants to preserve itself and be safe. As mm -hmm. those thoughts come up, I see them come up and I'm like, Oh, that's the thought that triggers my nervous system. And then I tell myself, I'm too exhausted. It is exhausting, isn't it? It and is just, exhausting. Yeah. And just by telling myself, I'm too exhausted to feel this again, my mind's like, yeah, we'll let that thought be. Yeah? It, yeah. Just like that? It works. That's, that's great. I, I, I not only am I exhausted, but like there's that wonderful page and it's called Healing from Healing. I feel like that. I feel like I Damn. have OD'd on healing. I have... I have put myself into so many like difficult situations because I have so much confidence in healing myself that I've yeah. OD'd on all yeah. 
the treatments. I've OD'd on all the healing modalities. Wow. And I remember just being one day at the gym and doing the thing that I do to work out and feel better. And I was like, dear God, I have pushed this thing through a lot of pain and suffering. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I love that though. That trajectory it of it though. Yes. And now you're going to, you're going to, you're going to bring it back a notch. You're going to receive a little bit instead of like hunting down this healing, which yeah. is super cool, but you have to, you have to go on that part to even realize, okay, you know what I mean? So I, I'm super proud of you. I didn't know you were doing any of this stuff. And you know, I, I do know that you're someone that tries to be the best version of herself all the time. Thank so you. that's, aspirational and inspirational for me and that's why i love you and i didn't know you were too. doing all this other oh thank you and uh yeah i i totally get that though because i'm also in this chase of always trying to be the best version of myself and in order to do that you have to consistently go on this hero's journey which is full of crap it's you almost have to invite the shadow and the trauma in for transmutation and at some point, you really don't even need to consciously do it anymore. It just, it just comes into your life. But when you feel like you're on that fast track to do it, you kind of want to do it. And I, I don't know if I've ever OD'd on the heat. I probably have. When I was in my last relationship, for sure OD'd. It was like an everyday, like, let's, let's transmute. Let's transmute today. And uh, I couldn't do anything else in my life. Like, it dominated my whole life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think maybe that's that was some ODing for sure. I love that. I've never even considered healing OD. And that is such a thing that is kind of like a blindsiding little little paradox within mm -hmm. the consciousness world. And I think a lot more people do it than realize. Yeah. I, when, I mean, I laughed so hard when I found that page, healing from healing. I was like, that's what I need to do. I need to heal from healing. <laughs> that's so great. I love that. You should just, that should be, you know, you should paint that on something and put it on a wall. I yeah. love that. So how are you going to start to apply this stuff? Because photography, you know, you're one of the few people I can talk to who, you know, understand the, the real game behind the game of photography, right? The whole, the whole dance that's going on. And for me, it was such a psychological exploration of awesome, you know, everything. And I, I loved the exploration of humanity through that. So... Yeah, I want to ask how you think your own, I don't know, your own calming down is going to start to impact that whole world for you. Um, Do you think you're going to see more? Are you going to, because you kind of have to listen anyway. So how, how will that even expand more for you? Yeah, well, I, I want to just like bring up two different two different points. What you're talking about observing humanity and really truly understanding I have been obsessed with this my entire life. Yep. Um, to the point that I leave my body. Mm. I leave yeah. my body and I join the person's energy. I become Absolutely. this hyper empath. And so part of my nervous system issue too is I'm not being present in my body. And so mm. now I'm also working more on not needing so much to know about everybody and just tuning into myself being like, I'm safe. Cause one of the reasons I need to know and understand humanity is for my own safety mm -hmm. because of my own childhood yeah. trauma. Right. So now I'm just trying to tell myself more often than not that I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm good. And I, and I tell myself things like oh, my girlfriend taught me this practice and it was really powerful. It sounds so simple, but if you try it, it's amazing. And it is, I am here. And you are there. That's your story, not my story. Mm. And that puts me right back in my body and, and makes me like, makes me understand that I need to take care of myself and that I don't need to figure out the other person to that yeah. depth of I've done it. I'm great yeah. at it. I can chill yeah. now. I can now I can like worry about myself and start tuning into myself more and figuring myself out because I've spent all this time figuring everybody else out. I thought I was so go with the flow and chill. No, I just didn't even know what my wants and needs were because I had spent so much time with everybody else's wants and needs trying to figure out everybody around me and who they are. So now I'm like doing this thing instead. Yeah. And now bringing it to photography, um, you know, a lot of women show up and to the shoot and they, they come with all sorts of things. They're, they're doing mm -hmm. the shoot because they just went through a breakup. And they want to put on amazing images to make that person, you know, they're coming in yeah. with all sorts of things. 
from from their life and it all shows up because it all shows up on their facial expression yep um and, and more I've, yeah and more and so i've very much been the person that i'm not one to go everything's going to be okay because i don't like when people do that to me but i thought i was doing a great thing by reflecting back to them what i saw what i mm -hmm. see in them and just being like you're so beautiful and you're so talented and trying to show them all the ways that they're amazing is was actually a way of telling them that they'll be okay. And yeah. I'm still not hearing them and how important it is for me to hear them. So one, not giving them advice, not trying to make them feel okay, but you know, sitting with them in it, listening to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think, I think it's going to create a stronger connection with myself and women because I, I have a strong connection with men, but we all, with a lot of men, we kind of have the same like mentality. Like, why would you tell me something if you don't want to have a fix for it? And yeah. I have this disconnect with women and I'm thinking maybe that's why, because I've just been acting like a dude in their life. Which is, which, I mean, that does fuel the, you know, that dependent, like you, you offer a service to them in that way. And yeah, so I am curious to see how you not jumping to solve a problem will impact that space for you. Because that's, I mean, as a photographer, it is this dance and, and I'm a very direct photographer, but I do not, like, I want to see you interact in this little world that we are creating. And I, you know, and, and so in such a way, I'm, I'm more of a composer, I'm less of a direct director. And you're kind of similar in that way to me, like you are direct, but I, I've seen you shoot. And, you know, you allow them to be them. And that way, it's, it's very liberating. And you don't want to interject too much. And I almost never, yeah, I never share the photos during it. Like, I don't want to impact their own kind of conscious, you know, flow of liberation in the moment. Because, you know, if they're super worried about how they look in the pictures every five seconds, then they're not even there anymore. So I really try to create this thing where they get lost in it altogether. And it, yeah, it really... You know, I'm just over here kind of, you know, in the corner. It's almost like a, I'm almost like a voyeur in that way. Yeah. Right. But I've created the world for them to be, a, you know, to be an exhibitionist within. And that is really fun. So it's, only, it's like I'm there and I'm not there. And uh, yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, you're, you're heading in that direction. I totally have played with that too, where I don't want to offer solutions to them. Because I have had a lot of, you know, women come to me too who want this kind of cathartic experience of freeing themselves from some type of weird bind that they've been in. And it's really cool to witness that. It's really cool to see that happen. At the end, I'll show the photos and then they'll freak out. I'm like, oh, you know, and, uh, but they won't even, they're like, is that even me? You know, I'm sure you get that all the time too. Yeah. They almost don't even recognize themselves because they're not thinking about themselves in that moment so much. And that's a, that's a you know, that kind of ties back to what you're doing right now. It's like, stop thinking so much about all this crap just be and receive for a moment so that's cool yeah. i'm super glad you're doing that thank you yeah 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 I'll, yeah. i also feel very judged today because i've been in this listening class <laughs> i was gonna say i, better, I wonder I if i'm getting right. sarah no no i no, i don't want that i want like that i was like when you started saying that in the beginning i'm like okay am i gonna get the sarah i know or am i gonna get some like spiritually enlightened sarah new new version sarah and I, you know, the, the game is, is how do you, it's going to pendulum swing back and forth so much and yeah. you're going to find that sweet yeah. spot for yourself. And I can already tell just during this conversation, you have been less jumpy any than I have ever known you to be, which is super cool. It's super cool. Aww. And, uh, oh, yeah. I, love I love the feedback. Uh, no, it's, it's super amazing cool. to hear. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. So that is appreciated, right? That that helps fuel me. Thank you. It It is appreciated. And at the same time, you know, it, it becomes a game of like, how do you elevate yourself into these new systems that you're teaching yourself while still maintaining, you know, the very essence of who you are. Right. And that's another, you know, thing that I think a lot of people, myself included have, had to grapple with on the spiritual journey is how do you not lose yourself like we are here to be so unadulteratedly ourselves and we may evolve but i don't want to become this boring monk i have no like i want to be this goofy wild lion yeah ginger viking guy i never want to lose that i want to i want to be this 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 feisty kid the rest of my life yeah. 
but just happens to know how to articulate and live out, you know, an expansive thought process. So yeah, when I'm seeing all that, I'm just so curious how you're going to let this pendulum swing with all yeah. this, because I can see it's hitting you really hard, which is super cool. I just hope I still get that feisty Sarah. Oh, no, it's, it's it, what you just said is really funny because the, the overly spiritual Buddhist monk boring version, it's very not romantic to be fully enlightened, right? Like, no, remember that movie about it called is. English Patient? Uh-huh. And the soldier um, that the woman was going to see, and one night she shows up and she says to him, oh, well, what, what would you have thought or felt if I didn't come tonight? And he says, <laughs> nothing, because I had no expectations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just so, like, not romantic, uninteresting, yeah. boring. So, yeah, you're right. Like, how to keep that balance. It's, I mean, the enlightenment part is the most ordinary part of living, right? It's, yeah. Everything that's that's fascinating and, and exciting about life is the egoic trauma stuff. So, you know, it, it's a weird paradox because... Uh, it's so unordin it's so ordinary enlightenment is so ordinary everyone's just like oh my god it's gonna be so cool you know i'm gonna be floating and do it's probably the most boring thing on earth yeah it's the middle it's, way it's, it's, it's not yeah. the extremes it's literally no, the middle way. no it, it is the absence of contrast it is all in one there's nothing exciting nothing totally joyous nothing totally sad there's nothing to when you and, but by that time you hit that point you won't even really be feeling anything in contrasts like that anymore so you won't even know you it'll just feel like normal normality for you at that point so that's the that's the fun paradox that i have begun to witness about my own journey in that way it's just mm -hmm. it's nothing exciting about it but it is cool well, to overcome it is cool to transmute yeah. in the process towards getting there but yeah every yeah. time i hit these milestones i'm kind of like oh i thought this was going to feel like something and it just feels totally normal now that i've reached yeah. this particular point I, I'm trying to think back because I've had these like really wonderful, great moments of um, non-duality and absolute nowness, mm -hmm. and and ye, the road there I feel like is very ordinary and and is actually very boring. It's almost like you know living life on drugs your whole life, and all of a sudden you're off the drugs and you're like, oh, this is really boring. It's almost like that, and the more that it becomes familiar the more you start to drop into like new different levels. And so what I've experienced was a great kind of euphoric feeling of, I had so much peace and happiness in this moment that my mind doesn't have to go anywhere yeah. to excite itself. My body yeah. doesn't need to go accomplish anything. And just sitting here and the wind lifting the hairs on my arm felt like making love to the wind. <laughs> I love that. You know? Yeah. Um, and so I feel like those were like the moments where I reached like kind of like the next, the next level that I get to just have these like little glimmers of once in a while, but I don't actually get to reside there. But I think I understand that that's maybe where I'll be able to reside. You a hundred percent will. And that's where you're going. I mean, that's the art of doing nothing. Right. Or even, you know, uh, I, I reference this thing, the, the symphony of silence. When I go out in nature, you start to find the beauty and the mundane, and the more you stop wanting the intense contrast of like the caffeine rush or the alcohol buzz, all these things, the more you level out, the more you actually find excitement and beauty in everything that you wouldn't normally have. Yeah. Because there's so much more of that than there is alcohol or drug. You know what I mean? There's only, there's like what, 20 things you can put in your body to make you feel something. But there's infinite amount of things that can just yeah. bring you total awe if you're accustomed now to appreciating the beauty of that and not needing, yeah. you know, the stimulus or this depressant and all this stuff. And that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm going through all that right now. I'm trying to just kind of slowly chip away at each little thing that I usually really enjoy to feel something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I don't want to eliminate it altogether necessarily. It's not yet, you know, I'm not, I'm not an enlightened master yet, but right now, like I'm really enjoying this, this little space between structure and surrender where yeah. I can enjoy the things without being a total slave to them. And yeah. it makes me see all this other stuff that I just love that I normally would have just walked right by and not even cared about. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And that's definitely that's definitely a path. And there's a whole path where you don't even have to cut things out of your life. You just do it with awareness and you put it on your path. Totally. And then that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what that's the part of the path I'm on now, I guess. I'm, yeah. I'm enjoying things still, but I'm just not like a glutton. Yeah. You know, it's so easy to be a glutton yeah. for all this stuff. So, yeah. And being aware yeah. of like, am I chasing to feel something or am I really like in the yeah. moment with this thing? And yeah. understanding also like, cause like what they teach in Buddhism too, is like, let's say, let's say it's chocolate, not being overwhelmed by like this amazing experience of the chocolate, but like still enjoying the beautiful taste, but yeah. also understanding all the things that it took, like it's your taste buds and it's this and kind of like seeing the empty nature of it and the bliss of it. I like that. And experiencing like that. the bliss of it. So understanding it's like not the thing that's going to like, yeah. I should stop talking before I. No, I <laughs> I need you to talk. Like, for, <laughs> so here here's the the irony of having you on here is that I need you to talk a lot. I don't want <laughs> you to just listen. I need you. To, I need you to talk. So that's hilarious. So you're. I didn't even know you were on this retreat. I've been like, all right, let's talk next week when you're not trying to be quiet all day and listen to everybody. I love it because yeah. you know I can talk. So... I'll talk for an hour, no problem. But I I love our. I always loved our back and forth. So what is. You know, I have my I have my 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 things that get me going. Like, what are your what are your what are these what are these things that kind of take you out from the moment of appreciation of the of the basic? What are the things that you're trying to? I don't want to say eliminate, but what are some of the things that you are noticing kind of keep you out of appreciation of existence? Like, mm -hmm. are there any? Yeah, yeah. that's um, believing believing my thoughts and emotions to be true, believing mm. that I have to do something to, uh, mm -hmm. yep. it's believing that I need to, I need to have this thing in my life because this is the thing that's going to bring me like endless joy and happiness. Right. Yeah. And, so you're doing, and, so you're doing, and then uh, now I need to, now I need to protect that. Now I don't feel safe because I have the possibility of losing that. Now I've lost my ability, like my feelings of safety. So it's like all it's believing all of these thoughts and emotions and is believing that things that happen around me are, are permanent and aren't mm -hmm. changeable. And so, and the opposite is true. If I catch myself in that, I'm like, Oh babe, you forgot again, you forgot again, like where, what's the lie? And I'll sit with myself mm. and I'll, and I'll look for the lie. What am I telling myself? That's untrue. That yeah. I need this, that yeah. I won't be happy without this particular thing that the situation I'm going through is permanent. It's always going to be like this. And then I, once I unravel what the lie is and I dismantle it completely, I can let that go. And then I tell myself, whatever the situation is, I'm like, sweetie, it's, everything's impermanent. Everything's passing. Yeah. And you're everything. Like if you want to love life unconditionally, you got to like, you got to love everything that comes up. Right. No doubt. No doubt. And I got it. And I you got have to let it come in and flow. Yeah. And I got to experience this to get to this. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, this is a type of thinking that will, that will bring me back into, I guess, alignment. The now. It'll bring you back to the, the very, the very moment of now without, yeah, right. Yeah. We're going to bring in, we're going to drop a little dispenser in here and we're not going to worry about the past or the future, right? We're going to, we're going to stay right now. I, there's a, I do a very fun, so I don't know if this is actually not fun, but it's cool to see it work. I do this physical trauma release and you know, you touched on it before about the story not mattering and the story doesn't matter. But the story will take shape physically in certain areas of my body. And I have had a very physical life. I've had a lot of injuries, a lot of like deep, you know, tight pains and loose other thing, all this stuff. So much of my emotional story has taken place mm -hmm. in my body. So I met with a really cool energy worker, uh, a gal named Barb, who I'll you know, I'll probably throw in the captions at some point for this. And she does this thing called trauma release. And, you know, she guides you to be able to do it for yourself. 
So mm-hmm. essentially, yeah, you're just you're feeling you're you know you're you're going to go through the story, but again, the story does not matter. But you need to just think about the story, yeah. and you'll start to feel it, and you kind of have a meditation process laying down with yourself during this. And you start to feel this either tightness or looseness. You'll start to feel it somewhere in your body, and this is where like the Kabbalah is very mm. very cool to me because this whole tree of life that's climbed back up, and every part of your body is a is a unique element of that journey. And for me, I have a lot of stuff on my knees and my hips and the hips are just this kind of axis point between intellect and emotion. And even, even my sacral, that, that whole area is predicated on the balance of those two. So a lot of your sexual health is, is based on your emotional and intellectual mm-hmm. health mm-hmm. Of, of your hips. So like some, a lot yeah. of people have, you know, uh, reproductive or whatever performance issues down there usually have a bad hip. And so I have done a lot of really cool work on that. And it's wild, the, like the physical releases that you feel from this. And a lot of people just oh, wow. don't know how to let that emotion come through without the whole part of it is just letting it come through. Oh my yeah. God, teach me. It's a great one. It's a great one. And uh, I yeah. just added you to my, I just added you to my team. I'm on the team. I'm on the <laughs> team on now. My team. Oh, shit. No, it's so good. It's so good. It's wild where things pop up and the, if you just focus on that and then you start doing that loving awareness to that, to that space and just mm. let that, that pain run through and you'll start to feel it just kind of like dematerialize. You'll start to feel it oh, uncrystallize. Interesting. This yeah. actually reminds me of like deep tissue massages where the pain only goes away when I finally relax into the pain. But as long exactly. as I'm like tensing my muscle against... The exactly. and that's the problem. It just gets more painful. Exactly. That's it. So, so many people are scared of their emotions, but our emotions are what ground us in the reality of life. So, we have to learn to love them, good or bad. Wait, and are you th- saying that our emotions need to be heard? <laughs> and that we need <laughs> by to ourselves. Hear and ourselves? that's I know. That's why I'm loving everything you're saying about this thing you're doing because I'm like, I wonder if she knows this has nothing to do with how she interacts with other people. It'll just naturally be a byproduct of how she implements this for herself. And I love that. Shit. So that is so cool that you're doing that. And that's basically <laughs> what this is. So yeah, allowing yourself to like feel all this without, I need to fix this. I need to fix this. And uh, yeah, that's where that juice really comes out. So that's super cool. walking down this street because all the techniques I'm use, learning, I'm going to use for myself. So I'm going to have to say, Oh yes. <laughs> I, it's going to be great. I, I see. You must be feeling this way. Yes. I am absolutely feeling this way. <laughs> I love that for you. And you know, that's the whole, that's the whole shtick with real spirituality, right? We're all thinking, you know, everyone who thinks they're a freaking light worker, like, Oh, I'm here to save you. I'm like, no, you're here to save yourself. And in the yeah. process, you will radiate that inspiration out and other people will want to follow suit. And wow. that's, uh, I mean, that's yeah. Power. That right there is way more powerful, right? Than exerting your spiritual healing dominance over others and forcing people into it. What a waste of time! What what a, what yeah. a what a oddly like it doesn't even make sense. Like yeah, I need to learn how to be, but like follow this, do this. It doesn't make any sense. So I I love that you're doing that, and you know maybe maybe that's really the whole point of that of this whole thing that you're doing, is to learn how to let yourself feel this stuff without. Yeah. Feeling like you I, need to do that. I think, I think it's for both. I really think I, it's for me and it others. Is for, it is for, it will naturally but, be for others. But uh, yeah, I absolutely, I think, I think applying it to yourself makes it easier to apply to others. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. There's this, uh, success failure thing that I was talking to with a friend the other day and it just applies so much because I'm, I'm a little bit on your end too. It's kind of like this, you know, white knight savior thing where I want to make sure everyone's okay. And you're trying to save everybody. If you do not allow yourself to just experience the emotion of something not going the way you would expected it to, you can never actually even feel the success Um, on the other side of the spectrum and vice versa. Because if you have a successful moment, you're always going to be worried that this thing is going to come that you're going to need to fix. So you're always in this weird purgatory and never able to experience either end of the spectrum So yeah, learning to just like, listen is really just learning how to be okay with exactly what is happening without feeling like you need to do anything Mm. about it. So yeah, I'm loving all this. I got some insights from this because my need to help people 
through their problem. Well, their need might be to have to sit through their problem for a certain amount of time to That's really make a change. It. And if I'm helping them out way before they get to that breaking point, I'm not really doing them any favors. I'm not no. doing them a service. And it just comes this back is the down squeeze. to mm -hmm. they need to do it themselves. They do. And they don't even need to do anything. That This is the whole, uh, do you know who Stan Groff is? The uh, mm -mm. therapist in the 70s who first implemented LSD into his psychi uh, psychiatry practice. And he started to realize that the process of a trip that someone would go on mimicked the process of birth that a child would go through. And he broke it down into four perinatal matrices. And quickly, the one is the contraction starts. Two is you get pulled, you start getting pulled into a canal. Three is you're getting the, the deep squeeze, the deep squeeze. And then for the end of the light at the end of the tunnel, you come through and you can breathe. You finally have that moment of breath. And this was the ego death in the same process that people would go through when they did psychedelics. And it's just kind of a microcosmic example of what we go through time and time again in life. And no one likes that third that third matrix of the squeeze. People do not know that they're not going to die if they get squeezed. Mm. They, the more they thrash, it's like mm. quicksand. The more you oh, thrash, okay. the more you do that. Is is if you the second you can chill and just be like, okay, I know it's going to be oh, all right. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's when you can actually harvest the the wisdom of of, of yeah. the shadow of the trauma. You're you're talking about the uncomfortableness of being on it's acid. More than that. It's I, no, I they're not even remember, that. I was like, I don't remember. Being no, 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 no. It's like the, it's like when you go through an ego death, it's not even the physical experience. It's the thing that the psychedelic is putting you through for transmutation. That's a very hard thing. And it, again, it happens in life. It's, it's, you know, every month, right? You're, you're going through something really difficult and you don't know how to do it, but you know, you're going to live, you know, that there's light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. you're going to get to the other side. And a lot of people are always thrashing and freaking out and don't think they're going to make it. And they, they miss the whole, the, they miss the train. They don't get on the train. And so they don't, they don't reap what they were supposed to learn from that experience. And then they're yeah. going to have it again. Yeah. So yeah. the more you're just chill and okay with this, with basically getting killed, the feeling of death, the, the greater and the more stuff you're going to pull out of all this. So, yeah. Challenges. I, I came into this class kind of worried that even with all these really great techniques, that what the problem was going to be was my lack of awareness and um that's kind of ironic impulsive and being reactive and um i'm gaining i'm gaining so much kind of understanding about not having to find the truth in a situation yeah. that i i think i'm not going to be as reactive as i think i am because a lot of times like where I'm the most reactive and have the greatest time listening in a relationship is when I feel like the other person is saying things that are not true about me. Mm. And then I have to stop the conversation right there and then and fix that person's view so that the rest of the conversation can reflect truth. Right. And mm. what I'm failing to realize is they're translating, they're giving me their translated version of how they're absorbing it. And I yeah. and and what I've been hearing is, oh, this person is manipulating me and they're gaslighting me by trying to tell me that I am this, right? Yeah. And now I can let I can now let go of that and just be like, no, that's their with their own filters. This is what they actually see and hear, and I need to hear this translated version yeah. in their mind, and I need to let them get it out. Um, and this whole, like, um, trying to find the exactness in the moment has been hurting the entire process of both of us getting to where we actually need to go, which is yeah. resolution. The resolution is never going to come because I'm not allowing that person to flow. For sure. Do they recognize all, well, you, you obviously do. It's, this is such a mirror situation right that that filtration thing you're talking about yeah they're just judging you based on some part of themselves that they either don't like or some part of you that they wish they were more of so there's this weird you know yeah this weird mirroring going on so how do you yeah how do you let them just continue with that like what do you do after you let them do that 
after you okay i've heard you i understand is there like a next what's the next step i think making sure that they've completely exhausted everything that they have to say <laughs> okay um yeah. and then repeating back to them what i heard them say repeating mm -hmm. back to them how they must feel because mm -hmm. that's when they're going to really feel understood and heard mm -hmm. um and um taking responsibility in the areas that i can take responsibility in yeah. also i find that one of the things that has helped me in the past when i've been sarah and not qt is when i can tell the person well this is how i would have felt if i were in your shoes and i had totally. to deal with with me totally. right totally and at that point there's so much relief in them they feel heard seen understood that they're now willing to listen Mm -hmm. to may i share with you my view or my side yeah, yeah. and they're they 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 feel so they their their emotions have been you know de-escalated mm -hmm. their their heart is now open because you've taken some responsibility for your part you, yeah. you clearly understand you've gotten the message that they're trying to that they're you know trying to relay i know I, I, yeah. it takes me too long to describe things sometimes because i'm not as eloquent no you're good you're um, good you're great and, and then they're actually i th and then i think they become actually very open but i never get i don't get to that open part very often mm. because i jump in and need to fix the things throughout the throughout the conversation instead of once they've completed it yeah yeah it's that is a that is a tough one i do the same thing because i it's like i don't want it's like I want to tackle something while still malleable and not yeah. a crystallized thought. Yeah. So a lot of people are like, well, I need a couple of days to figure out how I think about this. I'm like, I don't, what? I'm not letting you spend three days turning this into a, a rock. Like, no, let's tackle this while it's still something that isn't like a truth for you yet. Yeah. You know, while it's still yeah. just kind of a thought, like an idea. And I, I definitely struggle with that because I'm like, okay, I'm, I, I love that. I love what you just said. I, I kind of I agree with it. But if I'm already hearing that it's something that just feels so wrong to me, I'm kind of like, damn, like, how do I just, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm letting you build a giant army while I'm just sitting here like waiting to get slaughtered. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. And they talked about that. They actually talked about that very really? thing today. How okay. there's behavioral types that are like, we got to fix it. We got to get to resolution. We got to get to resolution right now. And yeah. their behavior types, they need. 72 hours sometimes to fully process their position on this on this but why do they take? need to they have, have to, a position they have that's to my figure question it out because they don't know like they don't know how they feel about it yet they have to go spend some time with themselves and the entire thing to figure out like do i yeah. did i have did i do something that caused that uh. what was it about the other person that bothered me like you know sometimes we can come up with these answers really quick and know them in the moment and have yeah. all the certainty and yeah. other times there's different behavioral types and sometimes i fall into that one as well where i just need a little bit of i just need a little bit of space to look at it from different angles mm -hmm. and know exactly what it is that i feel because i'm not as decisive in that moment yeah and i don't feel been, like yeah. i can discuss that until i know i i've never been with someone who has been so quick to feel a certain way as as I have been. So it's very, and I've caught myself feeling like, oh, is this what being manipulative is? Because I'm already here and I'm trying to get you to feel something that you don't even know how you feel yet. But of course, it's like manipulation into into harmony. Like that's how I guess, you know, I'm not trying well, to make you feel you're bad. Really, it's because it's you're uncomfortable. And you're what you want to am? get. Yeah, you're you like you're uncomfortable with this person having this negative view, and you're trying to get back to level zero. You're you're trying to get back to feeling comfortable as soon as possible, and so you're trying to sure. get them to catch up to where you're at, where they literally are, literally where they, <laughs> well, they can't, <laughs> where they they don't have the ability to meet you there. They're not there yet. There's nothing. They're not there there's yet. There's nothing that you're going to be able to say or do that's going to be able to help them catch up. That's that's very oh, hard for me. And you're going to have to sit and stew in all these like uncomfortable feelings for the next three yeah. days. 
and like we're talking about really like lean into that uncomfortable feeling mm -hmm. and 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 try to sit with that and figure yeah. out where that's coming yeah. from it's a good it's a yeah it's a good practice it is a very good practice yeah but it's it's scary like if you have trauma like i have abandonment issues right okay so with like my abandonment issues if i have it figured out and the other person needs a break for three days oh man yeah. like yeah. those abandonment issues really kick in and i'm like <sighs> I, and sometimes like, it will look it'll look like avoidance too which really triggers me it really triggers me when you know yeah. especially if it's not verbalized in a way that i agree with in terms of the i need a couple days sometimes you know because you're in an emotion so it, it may not come off very graceful when someone says that to you and oh sometimes it will trigger me so much i feel like why are you just running away oh and that's i guess my my you know i don't feel like i have abandonment issues but that hits really hard when someone says they need time because it makes me feel like they don't care enough to want to address it right now. So yeah, I've got some do stuff feel, to work on too. Do you feel rejected? A hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It feels like this avoidance yeah. thing and they're rejecting because all I want is harmony and I yeah. tend to feel, and it's not even like my position. Like I'm very good at looking at my own bullshit and I'll happily, I'll happily be like, okay, like this is my side. Like, do you, don't you want, to reach harmony right now. You just want to do it right now. <laughs> I want, yeah. I, I, I don't want to stew in this shit. Like life is yeah, enough, yeah. you know, and there's enough yeah. shit to stew in. So totally. yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I love that this, I, I, love, I love all this. And it's something that, you know, I have had to work on accepting more because, you know, this is, this was a big thing in my last relationship. She was, and she did have an anxious avoidant thing and she would need time. Mm. And, uh, I had a very difficult time with that because it really yeah. came off to me like just pure avoidance and it yeah. wasn't like, oh, I need this to do this for my soul. I didn't see it that way, although that's clearly what it was. And so I would tend to be the six, you know, six, three Viking dude that would be like, can we please try, you know, and I, and that's where I would catch myself. I'm like, oh man, I'm dominating this and I don't want to. And I, and I don't know what the answer is, but clearly I just have to stew. I have to stew a little. You have to not know. I have to not know for 72 hours. You have to fall down a black pit of not knowing oh, this, flailing, oh, it's so, trying to grasp it's so onto awful. some reality. <laughs> that isn't even there. It's not even to there grab. to grab on. Oh, my God. Talk about an ego death, though. The, I mean, the moment I finally get that, because I intellectually get it, but the moment I integrate it down here, that'll be a big moment because that's that's always been something. That's Oh, I hate conflict. I hate it. You know, I'm okay with it. I just like I sometimes I just I always feel like I'm looking down at it and be like, this is so silly. I that in that way I hate it, and I just want to get to a point of harmony. And I just I always feel like I see it very clearly, and yeah, and I not everyone you know is on that same way of dealing with it, and that's that's the whole point of life, I guess. You got to learn how to dance with everybody. Yeah, and then ultimately yeah. you guys had to decide whether that worked in your relationship if that was something that you wanted, right? And it didn't. <laughs> and it didn't work for a relationship. So, you know, that's, I appreciate you bringing this all up because it was a thing. And yeah, and just this, you know, everything else in life is totally a practice of that stillness. I have a very hard time with that in a very committed relationship where I feel like we are one. So it's like the confusion is, is mind boggling me, you know, that, 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 yeah, that confuses me sometimes. I feel like I we're supposed to get it. Mesh, I think that's called enmeshment. <laughs> I, I have been in met, and that's that's something that I'm looking to not be so much of in this in this next one I have. Yeah. Because you know, it's like I, I want to dive into the exploration of everything that this dynamic has, and yeah, and so I, I want something different that is a little more detached and a little less you know merging, a little less enmeshed. I like that. So yeah. It's pretty cool. Are you feeling yeah. you're in a healthy one this time? I mean, it sounds like way healthier than I, I better say what yes. I've heard. You better say <laughs> yes. No, but it just sounds like it's really great. It sounds like, you know, um, it's... Man, we've, we've grown so much in the last two and a half years. I didn't even know that, long? that. Yeah. I didn't even well. know that adults could grow this much. I thought that once you're grown, you kind of are who you are. 
Damn, really? And um, yeah, so it's been a real inspiration to see him grow and sure. to see the some of the really massive changes that he's made um, and a lot of changes that I've made too. Um, yeah. And because of him, like we've really challenged each other and pushed each other to grow and we have just enough love in this relationship to want to grow for the other person because you know yeah if you don't if you don't love somebody with all your might um the motivations might not be there to make these changes and to grow no. and so because of a lot of love we've had a lot of motivation to work on a lot of these things and i'm just i'm impressed every day um you know i i I had a real issue with vulnerability and I had a real issue with being open about how I feel when I'm not feeling very good. Yeah. And these are all things that he's really, he's pushed me to become vulnerable. Um, I remember he even did a podcast at some point and somebody sent it to me. It was something like the most selfish thing somebody did to me in a relationship. <laughs> he was talking about me. And, oh. and my friend was like is he talking about you i was like yeah that's me. yeah and, and he was basically what he was saying is that i was always every time he checked in with me i was always saying i'm great yeah i'm wonderful i'm great everything's great oh, wow because i didn't want to i never wanted to affect anybody with my bad moods sure i always felt like my worth came from always feeling wonderful and always being the positive energy in the room. And so I try to hold that all the time, yeah. even when I wasn't feeling it. And what he was saying was, you're not allowing me to hold space for you. I can't mm. show up for you and everything that I want to do. All I want to do is show up for my girlfriend. I want to yeah. be able to hold you when you're not feeling well. I want to be mm. able to sit in the mud with you when you feel like crap and yeah. you've completely denied me any of that. And so, you know, the first time that our relationship kind of fell apart, it was because I wasn't allowing him to hold space for me. And I was always perfect and great and wonderful and positive. That's and a tough so, one. That's a tough one. Yeah. Is, is, is allowing yourself to trust fall on someone else other than mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, and he's good with that? He's he's good at holding that space for you? I guess he um, has been. Yes, very much. And and I also, what, what happens with people like myself, and I've watched this in my girlfriends, when you've spent your entire life not having a voice, not speaking up for yourself, not uh, drawing boundaries, when mm -hmm. you finally exercise them, you don't know how to exercise them and it just comes out big and strong and messy yeah. and sometimes it comes with a ton of shaming and the other person reacts to that it's a lot yeah. and and when they react to it it's very easy for us to go i knew it i knew it see i knew that they actually didn't want to hear me i knew that mm. i couldn't be vulnerable and so it takes a while of, of, of practicing vulnerability and boundary, boundary making um, to do it in a way that can be heard and is actually healthy. Completely. You know, we're all, I say this to a lot of my friends, we're all just two-year-olds with different age skin. And yeah. no matter what, it doesn't matter what age we are, if we're finally trying something at a deeply emotional level, for the first time, it's gonna be how like a two year old does it. You know, it's gonna be a little ugly. It's not gonna have mm -hmm. that. It's not gonna oh, have yeah. that that smooth, polished delivery yet. And we have to kind of we have to be kind of ugly with it for a bit before we figure out how it really needs to come out. So mm -hmm. you, know, you have to kind of just take that leap. But I'm I'm happy. You know, you're yeah, doing it, it. It was messy, and there was a lot of finger pointing. Yeah. And when I finally got to the place where I could actually really be vulnerable. Cause when you're, when you're trying to share and you're not vulnerable yet, it's very much like, well, you did this, mm. right? And that's mm -hmm. up. Like yeah. I would never do that to you. And there's all these Damn. different ways of like shaming the person. When you're truly vulnerable, you go to the person you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling with jealousy. 
Totally. Ooh, that makes me feel weak, right? Mm -hmm. Being vulnerable makes me feel weak. So I had to, I had to actually become really comfortable with feeling weak, which then started to feel less weak and started to feel more powerful to be yeah. able to share those things. And then as I started getting the outcomes that I wanted, that um, confidence just grew and yeah. grew. You need a couple of wins. You need a couple of little wins yeah. on that, that mountain uh -huh. climb. And then you start to, you start to get in your groove with it. But yeah, it's, that's, that's the, that's the tree of life climb right there. You know, you need to, yeah. you need to feel that you're not going to die every time you do it. And, uh, yeah, every, every time you live a little bit, you're like, oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah. That's super cool. Now, I want to yeah. ask you something as we're kind of tailing towards the end here. I was asked by a friend of mine on one of these the other day, and it was a very unique question that I was like, oh, wow. She says she likes to ask this question during dinner parties because everyone has a completely different answer. And my own thought process with it kind of made it obvious that that would be the case. What is your definition of romance? What does romance feel and look like mm, to you? It took me a second. Yeah, exactly. Um, connection. Keep going. Um, doing things together. It could be as simple as sometimes I'm in my most like romantic, I don't know, what would you call it? Uh, emotions, feelings. When mm -hmm. we do something as simple as take the trash out together. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's less about roses. It's less about like big acts, cards, amazing dates. For yeah. me, it's like the really small little things that we do together. And as you're taking that garbage out and you look at each other and you realize how much I'm enjoying doing something so silly and mundane with the other person, that feels so romantic to me. I love that. I love so that. Taking the car, taking the garbage out. <laughs> Such a romance. No, it's, that's a great, that's a great answer. It's, you know, the, I, my response to her was, I feel like the word she uses in romance is the word I use in intimacy because intimacy has a million faces. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be sexual. It doesn't have to be, any, it's just, yeah. it is that it's the connectedness It's exactly that. It's the intimate moment. It could be whatever the hell it is. Yeah. It's just that it's that river of intimacy that flows between you two that no matter what it is, you, you have it there. So it could be the garbage. It could be anything else. You know, I, I remember, you know, my last relationship, we would just sit in our backyard and like look at the sun, uh, sunset. Mm. And it was just like, Oh, you know, we wouldn't even talk and we were both talkers. Yeah. And that would be, that was one of my favorite thing. I never felt more connected. So yeah, I thought that was a, a fun little, little question. Yeah. A fun little question to ask too, because everyone has a totally different yeah. response. Yeah. Miss Sarah, I love you. This has been I love you so too. much fun. Are it you, was. when are you back? When are you back? I'm back on Saturday. All right. Well, I'm like 10 minutes from you now. Yeah. I'd so, love to see you. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. I don't live up in. Thanks for tuning in to another amazing episode of North of Chaos. If you loved it, and I'm sure you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell. You can also find links to all of our social media platforms down in the description below. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook so you never miss an episode. We're all on this wild adventure together and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode. So drop a comment or a question in the comment section and we'll keep this conversation going. So stay tuned for next week's episode. We launch one each and every week. So until then, stay weird and embrace the chaos.